Hi, I'm Rabbi Sid Hellbrown, a senior rabbi of Temple Beth El in Northbrook, Illinois, since 1995. And I'm Cantor Farron Cates Rudnick, Cantor of Temple Beth El since my ordination in 2013. Upon my arrival to the community, I made it a priority to help make the Jewish community a more inclusive community, beginning with Temple Beth El and reaching outward. I have been most fortunate in my work. The community is eager for positive changes and wants to be as inclusive as possible to welcome those with disabilities into our fold. Together with Rabbi Hellbrown, our dedicated staff and our committed inclusion team, which is made up of Temple members, Temple Bethel has been able to emerge and do outstanding work with inclusion. It's not that we weren't interested in being inclusive before Cantor Rudnick came. Inclusion was a theme we trumpeted everywhere. We thought we could accomplish it by saying we were a welcoming community. We used this phrase everywhere, on our website, in our bulletin, in prospective member letters. We talked about it at services, at board meetings, and to our teachers and staff. Yet despite our intentions, no matter how welcoming we tried to be, we were not successful in creating a more inclusive community. We examined and found different areas that needed to become more inclusive within the temple community. We started small by lowering mezuzot, bringing in guest speakers, writing bulletin articles, and providing workshops for our religious school teachers. As the months and years passed, Temple Bethel has been able to adjust all areas of communal life to be inclusive. We now proudly host a religious school classroom shared with our friends and neighbors at Keshet for children with severe disabilities. Our building is fully accessible. We provide large print prayer books and have a sign language interpreter. Even our bathrooms have changed as we have designated two as all gender bathrooms. In our efforts to continue this positive trajectory, we started to think about the other ways in which our community could become more inclusive. This was when we began to think about language and understanding that becoming inclusive requires more than saying we're welcoming. It calls for intentionality in all the language we use, changing old habits and thinking about what we're saying in new ways. There's nothing necessarily difficult in any of this, Instead, the greatest challenge comes from trying to be more aware of the impact our words have and understanding the value that can come from saying things differently. Whether it's the language we use in our building signage, providing guidance to our greeters and ushers, thinking about how we offer direction from the bima, or even the language we might use in prayer. When we began to think about how our worship could become more inclusive, when we applied that inclusive lens to the good that we were already doing, it became clear that our efforts were good, but our language was not. This was where the conversation began. We began to place emphasis on the areas of language that could use some tweaking, whether it was the language we use in worship providing our ushers with correct language to use, hanging appropriate signage in the building, and even looking at the language of liturgy itself. This is where our dialogue about the importance of language began. While much of this seems like common sense, there are ways in which Jewish tradition has created stumbling blocks for communities seeking to be ritually inclusive. Many of these stumbling blocks derive from the halakha surrounding those who are disabled and their ability to participate in various aspects of Jewish ritual life. Because this mindset is so ingrained, a question was brought to the CCAR's responsa committee asking, what are the obligations of the community and specifically of congregations toward physically and mentally disabled persons? After reviewing the traditional halachic sources on the status of those who are blind, deaf, those who do not communicate verbally, and those with other physical and mental disabilities, the responsa states, 
we should be sensitive to the fact that disabled persons have traditionally been regarded in light of what they can not do, rather than considering positively the unique capacities they have. We should encourage the inclusion of all disabled persons in our congregations. The responsa continues, our she'ela, our question asks whether the community or congregation has an express obligation in this respect. The answer is yes. We deal here with a mitzvah and include it under the obligations we have with regard to our fellow human beings. These are mitzvot bein adam lechavero. It concludes, we should allow for a creative interpretation of the mitzvot that would help to incorporate disabled persons into the congregation in every respect. The aim of inclusion of the disabled is their complete participation in Jewish life. Language can play a major role in determining how inclusive your community is and can be. There are many positive ways to adjust the language that is being used within your community. There will be a cultural shift when the community pays attention to the language it uses. There have been examples of this throughout history, where once the R word was an acceptable term and description for those with cognitive disabilities, a shift in the way society views disabilities and a shift in the culture helped to create a positive language change where that word is no longer an acceptable part of our vernacular as a label or as a term used to insult someone. More and more, people are using the word accessible as opposed to handicap, where handicap has a negative connotation and derives from a negative place for people with disabilities in history. Accessible is positive, and connotes an effort to welcome and positively change our culture. Temple Bethel's example of asking the congregation to prepare rather than rise is just one of the many ways to make a small change that, in actuality, makes a big difference. In this example, our language created a barrier to participation in worship. Within our congregation, worshipers are constantly being directed to rise at various points of the service. We began to ask, in what other ways can we communicate effectively with people during prayer if they are distracted by the physical emphasis in the service or distracted by the language and how we communicate throughout our worship? How can we make someone feel comfortable without placing emphasis on the struggles he or she may have with standing or holding the heavy prayer book? After some thinking, Rabbi Helbron suggested that we start asking the congregation to prepare for those moments during worship. After all, when we ask the community to rise, we are asking them to prepare physically, to mark the difference in the part of worship. But if someone is unable to physically prepare, why should we not give the option to mentally prepare? For those unable to stand, this instruction causes the worshiper to feel that their prayers are not acceptable. Others who may no longer be stable on their feet strive to follow the instruction, but end up focusing their attention not on acknowledging God's presence in their lives, but in simply maintaining their balance. Rather than instruct worshipers to rise, we have changed our language of instruction, asking them to prepare. Some prepare in a traditional fashion by standing for the prayer. Others prepare by lifting their hearts and souls, giving their attention to the words they will recite rather than on their physical limitations. While asking people to prepare for the Baruchu, Amidah, or Kaddish takes a little getting used to, an article in the monthly bulletin, a reminder in the worship handout, and a word by the worship leader at the beginning of a service for those who may be new, Create the space for those who wish to participate to feel they can do so with all their heart, soul, and might. After a short period of time, our congregation acclimated themselves to this new form of instruction. In truth, seeing worshipers participate in prayer rather than struggle to stand brings a great deal of satisfaction to all who are present. This change in language created a large shift in our community culture People are more aware both spiritually and intellectually, and people are all too happy to use language that is open and inclusive.
Other examples of language changes that can positively shift culture to be inclusive, particularly in a synagogue setting, is to address the liturgy that uses literary devices to express a particular idea. At the 2015 American Conference of Cantors annual convention, I had the privilege of co-leading a tefillah that was focused on inclusion, in particular on various ways to craft a service that is fully inclusive, from visual aids to a sign language interpreter to eunim that express the liturgical themes but used inclusive ideas and language to rewriting the liturgy. My co-leaders and I spent a great deal of time examining the daily miracles and explored the literary devices used in the translations. In the end, we retranslated three of the miracles that use language that is not inclusive. Although the Hebrew may say, pokeach ivrim, literally opens the eyes of the blind, this is referring to awareness, not a literal miracle where God opens the eyes of those who God created blind. While some may find it difficult to rework liturgy, it is effective, and it would also not be the first time in history that this has happened. In the reform movement, we no longer thank God for making us men. We added the mothers to our Amidah, and we reworked difficult language in Hashkivenu. A little thought and a little effort may create a significant positive change. Understanding also leads to change. For example, where people once associated hearing disabilities and deafness with cognitive disabilities, as we, as a society, came to understand the different ways of communication, we were able to shift our views to be more open to those with hearing-related disabilities. Education goes a long way towards understanding. This is why it is crucial to work with your teachers, lay leaders, Shabbat ushers, and staff in crafting and teaching appropriate and inclusive language. Communication comes in many different forms. Some of us communicate verbally and orally, some visually, some kinesthetically. Because we at Temple Bethel want everyone to find a place and find a way to communicate, we have hired a wonderful sign language interpreter, a young woman who is the daughter of a congregant who earned her degree and certificate in sign language interpretation. As a cantor, I know that music can be a very powerful tool of communication. What has been truly amazing for our congregation has been witnessing the powerful impact that sign language, a form of communication and a language, has had within the community. It is truly a beautiful gift to see our religious school students using sign language regularly during school to fila. The students are enamored with our interpreter and have studied what she does and now openly and excitedly use sign language when praying in our religious school. Language and communication are so powerful, and language, when inclusive, can have a lasting and invaluable impact. Communication is a large part of what makes people connect. When we find that we cannot easily communicate with someone, that we may not speak the same language, we tend to exclude that person from the community. However, when we communicate with intention, when we think about the impact of the language we use and the messages it conveys, we can and will become more inclusive. For more information, please contact Cantor Farron Cates Rudnick.